Testing, one, two, three, check.
Good morning, Calvary Chapel. How's every happy Palm Sunday? That's awesome. Hey, I wanted to start the service today on Palm Sunday by just reading what Palm Sunday is all about. Um, if you turn in your Bibles, turn in your Bibles to the, the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to read on, on, on Luke chapter 19, the, the uh, Palm Sunday, and what happened on Palm Sunday. Uh, theologians call this the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. So turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19, and let's start with verse 36. It says this, as he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. And as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. And they were shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, what does it say? The stones will cry out. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to give some praise to God this morning. And before we do that, we'll pray. But also I want to encourage you. Uh, this is e- uh, coming up. We're coming up on Good Friday and Easter next weekend. And so uh, put this on your calendars. 7 o'clock this Friday will be our Good Friday uh, communion service. We have... Um, Jews for Jesus coming, and they're going to present a, a Passover and how that ties in to uh, the Lord's Supper and uh, what Jesus did for us as the Lamb of God who takes away our sins. So we'll, we'll celebrate that on Good Friday. And then Easter, we're going to have three services, not two, three. And we're going to have a 7 o'clock sunrise service out here, and then a 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock uh, Easter services inside here. So also, um, uh, we're going to have a, a outreach and what we're doing is we're sending out postcards to the whole community, and, and, and they're going to get uh, postcards inviting them. So be praying for that. Amen? And let's pray right now for our service. Father, we just thank you so much for another Sunday in your house, Lord. Thank you so much, God, that as we meet in your name, Father, you, you, you say where even just two or three are gathered in your name, you're present here, Jesus, and we thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, this Palm Sunday that we would celebrate Jesus Christ today because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Father, we just thank you for uh, Palm Sunday that we remember that Jesus Christ came to be the, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And he accomplished that by what he did on the cross and what he did in rising from the grave, Lord. And so, Father, I pray this service that we would just come into your presence with thanksgiving and joy and praise and worship. May our worship be in spirit and truth this morning, God because you are worthy of our worship. We pray for our country, Lord. We pray that you continue to just move. And I pray, Lord, that revival would come by your spirit, Lord. And may the church, may we, the church, be the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And may people see Jesus through us being the city set on the hill that you've called us to be, Lord. So bless this time, Lord. May it be all for your glory. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said. All right, church, let's stand and worship. Miss 
Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed I will not 
Jesus, in all things, you do deserve the greater glory. For those of us that know him, we know what he's saved us from, what he's taken us out of, the things he's working us through now. Jesus, we're so thankful that you walk beside us in every stage of life. I'm so thankful that you don't leave us in the dirt. I'm thankful that you convict our hearts and you bring us into repentance so we may be right with you. Jesus, thank you that it was your propitiation, propitiation on the cross, the payment for our sins that can allow us to live freely in you. That when we come to know you, you give life, you give it abundantly. It's not always the promise of money or good health, but it's the promise that we will live a blessed life. So Jesus, this morning, fill us, just as the word says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So may you fill us this morning with your spirit. May you convict our hearts. May you help us to look into the mirror to see if we look more like you or more like our flesh. Jesus, help us to put to death the things of the flesh. Help us to walk in the spirit. thank you once again that you just made a way for all of this possible. That we may live past our sin, past our own human deficiencies, past our own faults, because we, when we come to you, this, the word is clear that we are a new creation, that the old is gone, that the new has come, that there's been an identity change. But thank you even that when we fall seven times, we get back, back up again, as Proverbs says. So Jesus, this morning, for those in this room that know you, make us more like you. Help us to mirror you, your image, and what that means to be holy. For those that don't know you, Jesus, convict. Holy Spirit, soften those hearts in this room so they may hear your voice, so they may feel your drawing. Because Jesus, we can't draw men unto you ourselves. The word is clear that you draw men unto you. So Holy Spirit, draw them this morning. Draw every heart in this room closer to you. And I pray this in your name. Good morning, and welcome to Calvary Chapel. I'm Joseph Scott, and I'm the administrative pastor here at Calvary Chapel. At Calvary Chapel, our focus and vision is to love God, love people, preach the word, and make disciples. Each week, there are many opportunities to be in fellowship, study the word, and worship together. Weekly activities include Sunday morning and Wednesday night services, men's breakfast, women's Bible study, Friday night U-turn for Christ service, and various small groups. And we want to invite you to join us whenever you can. We have some events coming up that we want you to know about. On Good Friday, March 29th, we will have a Good Friday service in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. The service will include communion and a special presentation entitled Christ in the Passover by David Brickner from the Jews for Jesus ministry. Childcare will be available for nursery and preschool aged children. Due to the Easter holiday, there will be no Wednesday evening services on March 27th. Join us on Sunday, March 31st for our special Easter services. 
This year, Easter services will include a sunrise service in the outdoor amphitheater at 7 a.m., as well as our typical 9 and 11 a.m. services in the sanctuary. The services will feature a special Easter message on the resurrection of Jesus and will include an opportunity to receive Christ. So remember to invite an unchurched friend to come with you. There will be free donuts from Dunkin' Donuts for all who attend and all first time visitors will receive a complimentary Calvary Chapel coffee mug and a $10 Dunkin' Donuts gift card. The Student Ministry Spring Break Retreat will be April 1st through 5th at Camp Gilead in Polk City, Florida. Activities will include tubing, paintball, swimming, bonfires, Bible studies, and a beach day at Fort DeSoto Park on the Gulf Coast. The cost of the trip is $50 and is open for middle and high school students. Registration is available online at cclexington.org. At Calvary Chapel, we love babies and kids. We work hard to provide excellent nursery care and children's ministry for them. If you choose to bring your little ones into the adult service and they get noisy or restless, please bring them to the appropriate nursery or children's ministry classroom. Mothers of babies are welcome to stay with their children in the nursing mom's room where streaming of the adult service is available. The first Sunday of each month at Calvary Chapel is Friends Sunday. Remember to invite a friend to church on Sunday, April 7th. You and your first time guest will each receive a free $5 Dunkin' Donuts gift card at the Welcome Center. If you are visiting with us for the first time, we would like to invite you to stop by our Welcome Center where you can meet some of our staff, ask questions, and pick up a free gift from us. We are so glad you're here today. and We invite you to worship, learn, and grow with us now. Good morning again, Calvary Chapel. Hey, um, postcards, I was mentioning them, and they're actually in the pocket in front of you right now. So let's do this. Take out the postcards that are in the pocket in front of you and uh, put them up in there right now. Okay. okay. Got it? All right, come on. All right, this is uh, what Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And you know what this is? It's the bait. And so uh, the postcards aren't for you. Bring them home and uh, invite a neighbor, invite a friend, whatever else. Again, uh, we're going to have some great services on Easter Sunday coming up here. We're going to have a, a, just a glorious time of celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ not only died on the cross, but he rose from the grave on the third day. So invite some people next week and see what God does with that. And we'll have an opportunity next week, too, for people to receive Christ. And so this is going to be an opportunity for uh, you to invite some people and see if they come to Christ. And God will use you that way. So today, we're back in the scriptures. And what we're looking at today, we're going to see today in, in regards to um, benefits. Benefits of being in Christ. Uh, last week, we saw God's amazing grace. And we saw that if, if we're in Christ, that we've become a Christian, that by grace we've been saved through what? And that, not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Not as a result of works that no one should boast. But then, after we get saved by God's grace through faith in Christ, we become God's workmanship, created in good works. And that word workmanship uh, was poema. It's, it's that, that piece of art that God wants to be working in our lives in such a way that we become his masterpiece and other people see God's beauty, God's love, and God's grace through God working in us and through us. Now, this week, we're going to see the benefits that come from God's amazing grace in our lives if we're in Christ. And these, I, I call them bennies, benefits, right? I remember uh, all four of my kids went to Clemson. I was a Gamecock fan until all four of my kids became Tigers. And they got my money, and now I'm a, a Tiger fan. And if you're Gamecock, God bless you. But uh, all four of my kids went to Clemson, and after they graduated from Clemson, they went through the job interview process. And as they were going through that job interview process, they not only looked at the salaries that were being offered them, they also looked at what? The benefits. They looked at the uh, 401k opportunities, or they looked at you know, the, the insurance, or uh, whatever else that was offered them. And then after they got their jobs, they worked hard. And one of the reasons they worked hard is because this company, the, whatever they were working for, was paying them a salary and also giving them benefits. 
And you know what? God's not only saved us through grace by faith in Jesus Christ, he's given us some incredible benefits that come from uh, the grace of God. And we should work hard for the kingdom of God. We should be those people that are being steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our toil in the Lord is not in vain because of not only what God has done in saving us, but also what God has done in giving us all these beautiful benefits that we're going to see today in the scriptures. So what we're going to do as we go through this scripture, we're going to, I'm going to give you a word for each one of those benefits. I'm going to give you six words for each one of the benefits that, that Paul talks about that we get from God's amazing grace. So we're back in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. If you're there, say amen. amen. Okay, here we go. Therefore, remember that formerly you the Gentiles in the flesh, this is verse, chapter 2, verse 11, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Now, what Paul's doing here is he's saying, therefore. Whenever you see therefore, what are you supposed to ask? What's it there for? Right. And what it's there for is he's referring back to God's amazing grace. And because of God's amazing grace, he's saying, remember. Two times in those two verses, he's saying, remember. Remember what? Remember that you formerly, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, what he's saying there is, remember where you came from. Remember that you were Gentiles. Now, Gentiles means that they were pagans. And, and the circumcision, which is the religious Jews, looked upon them as pagans, and they were. The circumcised was, is talking about God's covenant people. Uh, the circumcision was a sign of the covenant of being a part of God's people. And they looked upon the Gentiles as pagans. And it says, too, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ. You were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. Now, the commonwealth is the, the citizenship of Israel. And that's the people of God. You are excluded from the people of God. And you were also, notice, strangers to the covenant of promise. What does that mean? They were strangers to God's work. The covenants of promise is all the promises in God's word. And not only that, it says you had no hope. What's hope? Hope is an expectation of coming good. And because of your lostness, Paul said, you Ephesians, you had no hope. Now, when we come to Christ, the opposite is true. Colossians 1.27 says Christ in us is what? That's the hope of glory. That's our future. You know, to, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Because we have the hope of heaven. The best is yet to come if we have Christ. But outside of Christ, there's no hope. And then it also says your, your, your status before Christ, Ephesians, and our status before Christ, not only no hope, without God. Now the words without God in the Greek there is atheos. It's the word which we get atheist. And that's all our, our state outside of Christ, by the way. We're lost. We're separate from Christ. We're without God, without hope. And some of you are saying, John, two weeks in a row, you're <laughs> talking about our lostness. I mean, last week it was about, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, going with the course of the world, you're dead in your trespasses and sins, you know, and you're under the power of the spirit of, of disobedience, and now you're hitting that on again? Why? Because Paul two times says, remember, remember, two times in two verses, because it's important for us to remember what we came from before grace. You know why it's important? Because we're told in the scriptures, he who has been forgiven much, loves much. And the more you, you remember what, where you came from, what God's grace did for you, the more you're gonna be grateful for the grace of God in your life. And we need to be people that remember just, man, God saved us by his amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a bunch of wretches like us. We were lost, but now we're found. We're blind, but now we see. And Christ in us is the hope of glory. And the, the more we understand where we came from, the more we're going to be grateful for the God that saved us. And the more we're going to love God because he who's been forgiven much loves much. You know, that's our greatest commandment, by the way. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. This is the first and foremost commandment. 
Seconds like it, love your neighbors yourself. But on these two laws depends all the, the laws and the prophets. And so we remember, because in remembering, we're grateful for the amazing grace of God in our lives. But now, let's go to some of these bennies, these benefits. It says this, first benefit. But now in Christ Jesus, you formerly who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Here's the first benefit I want you to see. Nearness. Nearness. You were formerly, he said, Ephesians, far off. And that's true of the Ephesians because they worshipped a false god called Diana. They had a temple that was the, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. That's, the temple of Diana actually seated 25,000 people. And then when they came to Christ, uh, they, they turned from the worship of Diana, and what they, what they did is they, they burned their magic books. Now, they were far off because the Scripture says that 50,000 pieces of silver was the value of the magic books that they built in the public, or that they burnt in the public area right there. 50,000 pieces of silver equivalent today to $5 million dollars. They were into some occult magic stuff, and they repented. But before that, can you imagine? They're cold in all the darkness they were in. And now it says, because of Christ, you were far off. You were a cultist. You were you know, worshiping this Diana. Now you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. And by the way, that's the only way we're brought near to God. It's by the blood of Christ. Because 1 Peter 3.18 tells us the just Jesus died for our sins once for all, the just for the unjust in order to bring us to God, and been put to death in the flesh, but made alive, notice, in the spirit. Amen? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Very clear. Also, 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, there's one God, one mediator between God and man, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. He's the only way. Acts 4.12, Peter preaching said this, there's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. The blood of Christ, it's the means that God has used to bring us near, near. And the lights just went off when I said that. (laughs) Hey, the lights are supposed to go on when I say that, that he's brought us near, amen? All right, so he has brought us nearer by the blood of Christ. Now, um, question. What happens as Christians when we don't feel near? Did God move? No. In him we live and move and have our being. It's very clear in Scripture that God is omnipresent. Jesus said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus made it clear that you know, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. So if we don't feel near to God, who moved? We did, right? And the solution to that, to feel near to God again, is practice what James said in James 4, 8, when he says, draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And what it's saying there is if you don't feel close to God, Start going back to drawing near to him through those spiritual disciplines he's given you, like being in his word, by being in fellowship with other believers that are near to God, by being in having devotions and having quiet times again. And that's why, actually, this church in Ephesus started to drift away from God, and Jesus addressed that in the book of Revelation when he spoke to the church in Ephesus, and he said this, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love Therefore, remember for where you where have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I'm coming to you and I'll remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Feel distant from God? Then, hey, draw near to him. Repent. Remember what you were doing when you were close to him and then repeat those deeds again that you were doing. You know, I remember coming to Christ out of being lost and being far from God. And I remember the beauty of nearness to God when out of a lost state. I remember having my first uh, quiet times where I was reading the Word of God 
And God's voice was like speaking to me off the pages of scripture. And I remember uh, worship as a new believer and coming into his presence and feeling his touch upon my life. And I remember uh, praying and praying as someone who's been cleansed by the blood of Christ and I had access now, access to God. It's beautiful. I value that. And I want to guard that. And I want us to be people that experience that benefit of being near to God. But it causes, there's, there's a part that we play. We need to draw near. And we need to repent of those things that keep us distant from God at times. And how do you repent? First John 1 John 1.9 tells us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then we get right with God and we're close again by the blood of Christ. Amen. And then it says this also, after nearness, first word, second word is, goes on and says, for he himself, he broke down, this second word I'm going to give you here is reconciliation. He himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And here's our word. And that he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross and by it having put to death the enmity. So, so again, the second word is reconciliation. And what he's talking about here is that there was a dividing wall between Jew and Gentile in the first century. And literally, there was a literal dividing wall. When you went to the, the Temple Mount, there would be an outer court for the Gentiles, for those Gentiles that might be proselytes or whatever else, and there was outer court, but then there was a dividing wall to the inner court, which is close to the temple, which, which had actually a sign on it that said, if you're a foreigner or a Gentile, no, you can't go past this dividing wall. And if you do, there will be capital punishment. Now what it's saying here is that dividing wall has been abolished by the cross of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Galatians 3.28 talks about this. It says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And so what does that have to do with us? (laughs) We don't have enmity within our fellowship here between Jew and Gentile, right? That's not an issue here with us. But there is, within our culture, there is a need for racial reconciliation, And we need to be people that realize that uh, red, yellow, black, or white, they are all precious in God's sight. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's neither Jew nor Gentile nor any differences between races at the foot of the cross. And actually in heaven, it says around the throne of God, there's every tribe, every nation, every people group worshiping Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain. And you know what? We should bring heaven to earth in our churches today. There shouldn't be a racial divide among us as believers in Jesus Christ. We should have a harmony. That's what reconciliation means, by the way. It's taking groups of people that are in enmity and bringing unity and harmony between those groups. You know, back in the 90s and later 80s, Promise Keepers really became a strong movement among men. And I went to several of the Promise Keepers events, and I remember... The God was just moving and bringing repentance. God was moving and bringing many men to Christ during Promise Keepers. And I, I actually went to the uh, Promise Keepers Pastors Conference at the Georgia Dome in, in Atlanta. And I remember going to that, and there was 40,000 pastors there. Uh, as far as I know, that, that was the largest gathering of pastors in the history of the church. And I remember this just, just some of the best Bible teachers in our generation were there. Chuck Swindoll was there. Tony Evans was there. E.V. Hill was there. Jack Hayford was there. Some great Bible teaching went on during the conference. But my favorite part of that conference was about midway through, the, the people on the stage felt led to do an altar call for the uh, pastors of color that were there, the Hispanic pastors, the African-American pastors, the Asian pastors. And they had them come up, And as they came up, they had us just honor those pastors of color. And there's thousands of them. We cheered for them. And then we prayed for them. And then as they were at the altar, we worshiped some more. And it was like the ceiling of the Georgia Dome opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon us. 
And you could just sense God's smile <laughs> because we were just honoring those people from all different races that were part of our kingdom, the kingdom purposes that we have as, 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 as pastors and as leaders within God's church. Wonderful thing. You know, as we grow as a church, I'm praying that we're going to grow in diversity. I'm praying that we're going to be growing and reaching people from all different races in this church and that we never have a dividing wall there, right? That we'd have reconciliation because, again, in heaven, every tribe, every nation, every people are going to be in unity and harmony. Let's start heaven right now. Amen, church? And then it says this, verse 17. Here's the third, the third word I want to give you is peace. Verse 17, it says, and he came and he preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. Now, we have peace through Christ because it says in Isaiah 9, 6, talking about the coming of Christ, it says this, it says that unto us a son is given, unto us a, a child will be born, and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called, what? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and what? Prince of Peace. Jesus said in John chapter 14, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Don't let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Now, there's three kinds of peace that Jesus gives us. The first peace is peace with God. Romans 1.5, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God, right? Second peace that Jesus gives us is peace with other people. Because we're told in, in, in his Beatitudes, in Matthew 5, verse 9, we're told, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We're told in Romans chapter 12 that if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men, right? And it's important for us to be people of peace. We're actually told in Matthew, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, it, it talks about that if you are presenting your offering at the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering, therefore, before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come, come, come present your offering. You know what that's saying? God values our peace with one another so much that if you're worshiping at the altar and you realize there's something wrong with a brother and sister that you need to be reconciled to, get it right. Get it right. That's a priority for God, for that we have peace with others. But here's the third piece. Peace with God, peace with others, but also peace with ourselves. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then it says, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension shall guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. It's important. Peace with God, peace with others, peace with ourselves. I remember before Christ, I was, even as a teenager, I was trying to find peace. I remember I, I, I started reading books, self-help books. And you know those self-help books? They didn't help myself much. <laughs> so, then, so then I tried the, uh, I tried the PMA, Positive Mental Attitude, right? And, uh, you, you know, and, and there's some help with that in regards, because as a man thinketh, so he is, and I got a better attitude, but I didn't get peace. I read that book, The Power of Positive Thinking. I got more positive thinking, but I didn't have peace. And then, I'm almost ashamed to admit this, but I, then I, I, I said, okay, uh, the big thing, this was in the 70s, I thought, okay, I, I'll try this thing that I've been hearing about, Transcendental Meditation. And they encourage you to do the, the you bend your legs like in a, a pretzel. And uh, man, that just hurt. And then, hmm, like this. And I started doing that, and I started going, this is not giving me peace, it's just weird. I'm not going to do this anymore. But then I found Christ. And all of a sudden, not only did salvation and grace come, but peace. Peace with God, more peace with other people, and obviously more peace in my heart. Because Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Amen, church? So peace. Now, let's look at the next word. 
access. Verse 18, for through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Now access, that's the word when an official would bring someone and admit someone to the presence of a king. Our official is Jesus. And when Jesus died on the cross, what he did is he brought us access to a holy God. Now before the cross, the very presence of God was was guarded by a curtain, a veil in the temple. And the veil was this thick veil that would, would separate the holy place from the holy of holy place. And then on one day of the year, Day of Atonement, the, the high priest would be allowed to go beyond that veil. And then he'd be allowed to go into the very presence of God to, to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat where the Ark of the Covenant was at. Now, if that priest was not right with God, God would strike him dead. That's why the priest would go in. He'd go in and he'd have bells on his robe, but then he'd also have a rope around his ankle, and he'd go in there, and if they heard the bells ring because he fell over dead, they'd pull him out and they'd get another high priest. Do you, by the way, do you want that job? <laughs> That's a tough job right there. But what happened when Jesus died on the cross was he said, it is finished, paid for in full, you know, right? And then he uttered those words uh, before he died. He said, into thy hands, God, I commit my spirit. And then the veil in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. And it was torn to, be a, to, to show mankind that now you have access through the blood of Christ and the very presence of God. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? And that's why we're told in the book of Hebrews about this access. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, and that is his flesh. Do you see that? We have access to the presence of God. Access through the blood of Jesus and through what he did on the cross. Hebrews 4.16 says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. It's a wonderful thing. We have access. Access through the blood of Christ and through the veil being torn because of what he accomplished on the cross. And then it goes on after saying we have access, verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and you're of God's household. Now, the word there for God's household is okios in the Greek, and it can literally be translated God's home. And here's the next thing that we're being told is a benefit that we have in Christ. So we become a part of God's family. (laughs) And we're told in Romans chapter 8, that we're actually adopted into his family. In Romans chapter eight, it talks about this. Let's put it up on the screen. And it says this, um, for all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out what? Abba, Father, Daddy, it could be translated. And the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're children of God, and if we're children, we're heirs also, um, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we also may be glorified with him. And then Ephesians 1, back when we were there in the first chapter, it says this, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. I like that. You know what? Along with adoption, along with becoming a part of his family, what Paul is saying in Romans chapter eight is we get the privileges of being a part of God's family. We're joint heirs with Christ. All that Christ has inherited in heaven, we're gonna inherit one day too. We're gonna have that, that incredible glory that's in heaven, that's lighting up heaven to the point that there's no need of lamp or light. We're, we're gonna inherit that also. We have the privileges of the, being joint heirs with Christ. You know, I was trying to think of an illustration for this. We're part of God's family. And I thought of my dog, Jojo. I'm a dog lover. Always have been. Oh, did you pick the, oh there, there he is right there. That's Jojo. Okay? And we have another dog that's walking around right up here because he's, I, I don't know. Anyways. 
But why do I think of Jojo? Because I'm a dog lover, and when we get a dog, what happens is that dog becomes a part of our family. And so what happened with Jojo is, you can take that off now. Everybody's looking at Jojo and not me right now. (laughs) Okay. All right, so the illustration is this. When Jojo became a part of our family, she got the privileges of being in our house, right? And, and in our house, it's interesting, too, there's a couch just for Jojo. I'm serious. And um, uh, there's actually, okay, put, put, put it back up on the screen. Okay. You see that blanket? That's Jojo's blanket. That's Jojo's couch. And when Heidi and I sit down on our couch and watch TV, she jumps up on her couch And I I swear, sometimes I think she's watching TV with us. And then I go to bed at nighttime, and she transfers from her couch to my couch. How do I know that? Because when I leave the bedroom in the morning, uh, I'll hear her jump off, and she knows she's not supposed to be on her couch, but she's on it anyways. And I'll go sit on our couch, and the couch is warm. (laughs) This dog's got some privileges. And why does she have these privileges? Because she's, she's a part of the Hoppy household. She's a part of our home. She's a part of our family. And it's the same thing with us as adopted sons and daughters of God. We, are, we don't have a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. We have a spirit of sonship by which we can cry out, Abba, Father. And God's spirit even bears witness to our spirit that we're children of God. And we have the privilege of being joint heirs with Christ. The privileges of inheriting all these things that are coming to us as we look forward to heaven also. And the privileges that we have right now, of these benefits that we have right now. So let's go on. After it says that uh, we're part of God's household, it says this, verse 20, have been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also, after being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now, I want you to see this here. Let's break this down a little bit. It says that the church, us, the body of Christ, were built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. What's that? That's the Word of God. And if we're going to grow as a church, and that's our last word, by the way, growth, and if we're going to grow as a church, it's got to be built upon the Word of God. The early church continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And that was the first thing on the list they devoted themselves to. And why do we do so many Bible studies here at Calvary Chapel? It's because we're going to devote ourselves to God's word. This church is going to be built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets that wrote much of the word of God. And we need to be individually devoted to God's word too because it says like newborn babes, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, we're supposed to long for the pure milk of the word that by it we may, here it is, we may grow in respect to our salvation. And then the second part of our growth as a church and as individuals after the foundation of the apostles and prophets, which is God's word, is Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Now, the cornerstone was the foundation stone for the buildings at that time. The cornerstone set the direction for the buildings. And what it's saying there is, as a church and as individuals, we need to allow Jesus Christ to be our foundation. And he needs to not only be the thing that we're building our spiritual lives upon and building this church upon, but also he needs to be setting that direction for our lives. You know, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight, or he'll direct your paths. And then after allowing Jesus to be the foundation in our growth, it says we're this whole building fitted together. And by the way, the church is not a building, physical building. It's us, the body of Christ. It actually says in Peter, it says that we're the living stones of God's church. And also it says, in whom also you are built together into the dwelling of God in the spirit. So last word, growth. If we're going to grow as a church and we're going to grow as individuals, we need to be built upon God's word. We need to have as our foundation Jesus Christ. He needs to direct our lives in this church's life. 
And then also, we need to be people of the Spirit. Because it says in that last verse again that we're built together in the dwell of God in the Spirit. And in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, talking about um, just growing in Christ too, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So what God wants for us. He wants us to be a building of God, growing together, individually and corporately. Amen, church? So what are the six words we got today that are bennies, benefits that we have in Christ? Number one, nearness. Number two, reconciliation. Number three, peace. Peace, not only with God, peace with others and peace with ourselves. Also, number four, access. We have access through the blood of Christ and through the veil being torn. Number five, family. And all all you're going to go home with a picture of Jojo in your mind, (laughs) being a part of the Hoppy family. And number six, growth. And growth comes, again, from Jesus being the foundation and the Word of God being our foundation and the Spirit of God helping us to grow as God's church and God's people. Amen, church? All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for another Sunday that we could celebrate Jesus. Thank you so much, God, that you're a God that wants us not only to be saved, you're a God that wants us to be growing. And so, Lord, I pray that we would continue to be those people that are growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray too that we would be, be living out these things that we learned today of drawing near to you, God, so you could draw near to us. Help us to be those people too that are, 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 are racially reconciled with other groups out there, Lord. Help us not to fall into this prejudice that oftentimes is uh, in our culture. Help us to love all people equally because you love all people equally, God. Help us to be people of peace too, Lord. People that are drawing near to you so that we can be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. We can let our requests be made known to you so that your peace, God, could guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you so much, God, for the access that we have through Christ and through the veil being torn. Thank you so much, too, Lord, for the fact that we're a part of your family through Christ, through being adopted in. And Father, I just thank you too much for, I thank you so much too, Lord, for the growth that we're experiencing as we practice these things that we're learning here. Things like allowing Jesus to be our foundation. Things like prioritizing God's word and the study of God's word, devoting ourselves to that. And things like uh, being people of the spirit. So help us, Lord, to be people of the spirit. Help us to walk in the spirit, to live in the spirit, and be spirit-filled as we walk with you, God. Thank you so much, Lord, for another opportunity just to be fed by your word, God. We don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth, Lord. Help us this week, Lord, to go out there in the highways and hedges and be inviting people to be a part of your kingdom, God, because as we follow you, Jesus, you're going to make us fishers of men. Thank you again, Father, for the work of your spirit in this church and in our lives. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Let's all stand, church. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and give you peace. May the Lord give you a beautiful week in Him. May you live out these things we've learned today. May you be people of peace. May you be people of the Spirit. May you be people of the Word this week. May the Lord just give you a beautiful week in Him. And remember, (laughs) remember that Christ is King. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Remember that He came that first Palm Sunday, and the crowds were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. May the Lord bless you this Palm Sunday. Remember that you're serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. May the Lord give you a a beautiful Palm Sunday. And let's go out with some worship. God bless you, church. that you have carried thank you for your blood that was shed you took the weight of sin upon your shoulders and 
sacrifice to life so I could live.
Testing, one, two, three, check. Testing, one, two, three, check, check. Testing, one, two, three, check, check.
Good morning, Calvary Chapel. Good morning. Hey, um, we're going to read uh, Palm Sunday, but before we do that, though, I want to encourage you. Uh, we have uh, postcards on the chairs, and those postcards aren't for you. They're, they're invitations uh, for your neighbors, friends, family members to come to uh, Calvary Chapel either on Good Friday or Easter Sunday. We're, we're going to have uh, three different ser- or three services on Easter Sunday. We're going to have an outdoor uh, amphitheater, a uh, sunrise service out here. We're going to have on Easter Sunday then two indoor services. And then on Good Friday, we're going to do a 7 o'clock uh, communion service with Jews for Jesus. It's going to be a wonderful weekend. So invite some people, and uh, we'll have a great uh, uh, Easter weekend, starting with Good Friday and then culminating with three services on Sunday. Okay, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Luke chapter 19, verses 36 to 40. And we're going to look at the very first Palm Sunday, because today is Palm Sunday. So Luke chapter 19, verse 36, and it was, as he was going, talking about Jesus, they were spreading their coats on the road. And as soon as Jesus was approaching near the descent of Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. And they were shouting, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now another gospel says they were also saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save now, save now. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these became silent, the stones would cry out. It's pretty amazing. He said, if the people stop saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, my creation will declare who I am. So let's pray for our Palm Sunday service today. Let's pray that God would just meet us in this place in a powerful way. Let's pray right now. Father, we just thank you for another Sunday in your house, Lord. And we thank you, God, that this, this is your place for prayer, for worship, for your word, God. And Father, as we celebrate Palm Sunday today, We just thank you, Jesus, for being our Messiah, our Savior, and our Lord. Thank you, Jesus, we have another opportunity to just give you the glory that you deserve. You're worthy of our worship. And we're going to worship you this Sunday, this Palm Sunday, in spirit and truth. And so bless this service, Lord. May you, again, pour out your spirit in this place. And may we just be grateful, Lord, that uh, you so love the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but we have eternal life. And Jesus, we're grateful for the joy set before you, that you endured the cross for us. And we're grateful, Jesus, that you entered Jerusalem with a triumphant entry, with the people saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now, save now. But we're also grateful that uh, after you died on the cross for our sins, you rose again. And we're going to celebrate that next weekend. We look forward to that. But today, today, God, Meet us in this place. We, we believe and we trust in Jesus' promise where two or three are gathered. In Jesus' name, you're here. So may your presence and your power and your spirit be powerful in this place this Sunday, God. We pray for our country. We pray that you continue to just move across this land and this country, God. We pray for all the Easter services that will be next weekend across this whole country. We pray, Lord, that it would be just a time where many might come to Christ. Bless this service, though, Lord, today. And may it be all for your glory, God. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, let's stand, church. Let's give uh, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords some praise this morning. Rescue me 
as people of God, when we come to you, we are accepted into your kingdom if we repent and confess your name as Lord, admitting that you've died on the cross for our sins. the price for it, so we no longer would have to suffer the consequence of eternity without you. Jesus, thank you that you made a way, that you made that connection for us to once again be in communion with God as it was meant to be in the Garden of Eden. That perfect communion, that matrimony and marriage, that promise and covenant to us that you will never leave us or forsake us and I thank you Jesus even after you died on the cross your promise is that you would send a helper called the Holy Spirit to rest on and in us so we could live every day walking in the presence of you that Jesus there is a helper that can help us put to death the flesh and the things of this earth and it can make us more into your image. It convicts, it helps clean up the things in our life that need cleaning up. Not because you're ashamed or angry at us, but because you want perfect and holy communion with us. Jesus, that you want to be in our life. the same image that the shepherd runs after the one and leaves the 99 behind as every day you're chasing after us. And maybe some of us have run in this room as far as we think we could from Jesus because we're afraid of what he'll think when he sees us. Oh, but how you welcome us back. And I feel like that prayer is for somebody in this room this morning. You're welcoming them back. Saying, I don't want relationship with you to beat you up and to shame you and to make you think that I'm angry. I want relationship with you so you can be more like me. I want to be connected to you. Jesus, I pray we never let go of that. Yes, we are to be as holy as you are holy. But Lord, I thank you that your forgiveness and your mercy doesn't run out. I pray this morning for those in this room that have walked away from the Lord thinking that he's angry, thinking that he wants nothing to do with you. Lord, I thank you that you're calling them back this morning, knowing that you welcome with open arms. And I pray this morning that there will be a revelation of that in the hearts and the minds of those in this room, that the Holy Spirit isn't coming to convict us just to make us disappointed or angry at ourselves. The Holy Spirit wouldn't want to clean a house he doesn't want to live in. But he wants to live in us. He wants to help us walk alongside Jesus. So this morning, Jesus, as you convict, as you call us back into your presence, may we all in this room take account of what's going on in our lives and turn back to you. As I know many in this room probably think the same thing. We, the day is near that Jesus is going to come back. We don't know an exact time, but the signs are there. And Jesus, I pray that on the day that you come back, we can be in your presence again. Not just the presence we walked with on this earth, but face to face. We're all pain all tears, all sickness, all the things of this earth have passed away. There's nothing but peace and rest in the presence of the Son of God. So 
So Jesus, this morning, as Pastor John brings the word, may you draw us into your image. May you draw us into your presence. Make us more like you. And help us to realize that you aren't here to condemn us. You're here to be with us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Good morning, and welcome to Calvary Chapel. I'm Joseph Scott, and I'm the administrative pastor here at Calvary Chapel. At Calvary Chapel, our focus and vision is to love God, love people, preach the word, and make disciples. Each week, there are many opportunities to be in fellowship, study the word, and worship together. Weekly activities include Sunday morning and Wednesday night services, men's breakfast, women's Bible study, Friday night U-turn for Christ service, and various small groups. And we want to invite you to join us whenever you can. We have some events coming up that we want you to know about. On Good Friday, March 29th, we will have a Good Friday service in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. The service will include communion and a special presentation entitled Christ in the Passover by David Brickner from the Jews for Jesus ministry. Child care will be available for nursery and preschool aged children. Due to the Easter holiday, there will be no Wednesday evening services on March 27th. Join us on Sunday, March 31st for our special Easter services. This year, Easter services will include a sunrise service in the outdoor amphitheater at 7 a.m., as well as our typical 9 and 11 a.m. services in the sanctuary. The services will feature a special Easter message on the resurrection of Jesus and will include an opportunity to receive Christ. So remember to invite an unchurched friend to come with you. There will be free donuts from Dunkin' Donuts for all who attend and all first time visitors will receive a complimentary Calvary Chapel coffee mug and a $10 Dunkin' Donuts gift card. The student ministry spring break retreat will be April 1st through 5th at Camp Gilead in Polk City, Florida. Activities will include tubing, paintball, swimming, bonfires, Bible studies, and a beach day at Fort DeSoto Park on the Gulf Coast. The cost of the trip is $50 and is open for middle and high school students. Registration is available online at cclexington.org. At Calvary Chapel, we love babies and kids. We work hard to provide excellent nursery care and children's ministry for them. If you choose to bring your little ones into the adult service and they get noisy or restless, please bring them to the appropriate nursery or children's ministry classroom. Mothers of babies are welcome to stay with their children in the nursing mom's room where streaming of the adult service is available. The first Sunday of each month at Calvary Chapel is Friends Sunday. Remember to invite a friend to church on Sunday, April 7th. You and your first time guest will each receive a free $5 Dunkin' Donuts gift card at the Welcome Center. If you are visiting with us for the first time, we would like to invite you to stop by our Welcome Center where you can meet some of our staff, ask questions, and pick up a free gift from us. We are so glad you're here today. We invite you to worship, learn, and grow with us now. Good morning again at Calvary Chapel. Hey, we're going to be back in the book of Ephesians this morning. And what we're going to look at this morning is uh, Ephesians 2, verses 11 to 22. And what we're looking at specifically is the benefits we have of being in Christ. You know, um, uh, the benefits really of grace. And last week we saw that great section of Scripture on God's amazing grace. We saw that even though we were dead in our trespasses and sin, even though we were going the course of this world, even though we were uh, sons of disobedience with a spirit of disobedience, last week we saw that God, if we believed in Jesus, God has rescued us by his grace. We saw that God, because he's rich in mercy, he's great in his love, and he's rich in his kindness and his grace towards us, by grace we've been saved, right? Through faith. That not of yourself. It's a gift of God. 
not as a result of works, that no one should boast. Then we saw that great scripture that we become, after we're saved by grace through faith, we become his workmanship, which literally means uh, his, his poema in the Greek, which literally means his masterpiece. We become his work of art, where people, as he works in our lives, people could see the, 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 the love of God in us. They could see the grace of God in us. They could see uh, the, the changed lives, because if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And we become his, his expression of himself to this world as God works in our lives. Now, what we're going to see today is the benefits that come to us now if we're saved by God's amazing grace. We're going to see what I would call the bennies. Uh, all four of my kids went to Clemson and graduated from Clemson. I was a Gamecock fan until all four of my kids decided to go to be, be Tigers. And now that they got our money, they said, we're Tigers. And uh, as they graduated from Clemson, one of the things we did was we encouraged them to, to not only do the job interviews and stuff, but they not only had job interviews and they had offers for this or that for salaries, they also had benefits they had to look at, right? They had to look at the 401k. They had to look at the uh, whatever, uh, the insurance policies or whatever that the, the potential jobs would offer them. And then as they got jobs, they worked hard. And they continue to work hard because, because they know that they're getting paid and they're getting benefits too. Now, um, analogy for us. We're saved by God's grace through the cross and through our faith in Jesus Christ. And we're saved, but not only are we saved, we're going to see today, we get all these benefits from being saved. Of God's, we get benefits from this grace also. And I believe we should have, as a response to that grace and those benefits, we should have a heart that wants to work hard for Jesus. A heart that wants to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our toll in the Lord is not in vain. Because not only has the cross saved us, but we're blessed with all these benefits. And so as we go through this scripture on benefits, I'm going to give you six different words that will describe six different benefits we have. And my prayer is as we are blessed by the knowledge of only his grace, but also the knowledge of these benefits, our hearts would be, man, I want to serve Jesus. I want to, I want to be uh, someone that, that makes a difference in this world for Christ because Jesus did that for me. Not only grace, but also benefits. Amen. All right, so let's jump right in. We left off in verse 11, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. It says, Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Now, here's what Paul's doing here. He's saying, therefore. Whenever you see therefore, what are you supposed to ask? What's it there for? And a part of what it's there for is he's going back to the section on God's amazing grace. And because of this amazing grace, remember two times in those two verses, he says, remember, remember where you came from. Remember that before grace, you were the Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles were pagans, Jews who were a part of the covenant of, and, and they're part of the covenant because they, they're called the circumcised there, would look down upon the, the pagan Gentiles as logs for the fire of hell. A, a, a religious Jewish person, is, if, if they were Orthodox Jew and they bumped into a Gentile by mistake in the marketplace, what they do is they go home and do a ceremonially cleansing because they touched a Gentile because these Gentiles were so pagan. That's their view, viewpoint. And, and, and it says here also, if you go back, that, that you were separate from Christ. You were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. What that means is you weren't part of the citizenship of heaven. The commonwealth is citizenship of Israel, the citizens of God's people. You were, you were strangers to the covenant of promise. What that means is they were strangers to God's word because the covenant of God's promises are found in God's word. And also they had no hope. Hope is what? Expectation of coming good. Now, when we come to Christ, Christ in us, it's a hope of glory. Hope is the expectation that this is all we got to look forward to as believers in Jesus Christ. But apart from Christ, there's no hope. And it says you're without God. 
That's our, our position before Christ also. The word without God uh, literally uh, is, uh, in the Greek, it's atheos. It's a word from which we get atheist. And some of you are thinking, John, two weeks in a row. <laughs> Last week you just painted this dark picture of our lostness. We're dead in our trespasses. You know, we're, we're, we're in the course of this world. We're, you know, all, all these things following the prince of the power of air. Now you're painting another dark picture again to start our sermon again on Palm Sunday. You know why it's important and why Paul is repeating our lost state again in this scripture? Because as we remember where we came from, we're reminded of God's grace and how God's grace has changed our lives. You know, uh, we're told in the scriptures, he who has been forgiven much, what? Loves much. And so as we understand where we came from and all that God's forgiven us from, it's going to make us love God even more. And our greatest commandment is to love God with all our heart, all our mind, all, all our soul, and all our strength. And so as, as we remember our state before Christ, Let's be people that just love God more because of what he's done and giving us grace. And then also, these benefits we're going to look at. So the first benefit, let's go. Let's go now. Let's, first word I'm going to give you is nearness. Verse 13, it says this. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Again, the Ephesians were, were from this lost Gentile pagan background. They had within their, um, within their city, they had the Temple of Diana. Temple of Diana was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. They, it sat 25,000 people. And they would worship in an occultish uh, way this, this false god of, of Diana. And they actually, when they came to Christ, they were so far off that they burned their magic books and it says the magic books were worth 50,000 pieces of silver. In our common currency today, that's, that's, that's $5 million of magic books. That's a lot, isn't it? And now they were far off. They've been brought near by the blood of Christ. You know, there's, that's the only way we're brought near to God is by the blood of Christ. Very, very specific in the scriptures, there's no other way. 1 Peter 3.18 said, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus said, John 14.6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the, to the Father except through me. No man comes to the Father but through me, Jesus said. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God, and there is only one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. I like what Peter said when he was preaching in the book of Acts. He said, Acts 4.12, there's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus, he's the way, he's the truth and life. There's no other way. And, and, and you know what? I remember when I came to Christ and I found the way. And I remember all of a sudden I was far off before that, I was lost before that, and then Jesus, through that relationship of him being the way, the truth, and the life, brought me near to God. I remember those first days of walking with Christ and, and reading the Bible, and it's like the voice of God was speaking to me. I heard, God, I heard God's voice through God's word. I remember entering into Christian fellowship for the beginning stages of my Christian life, and all of a sudden I had koinonia, Fellowship in the spirit with other people that were near to God. And just being around other people that were near to God, I felt closer to God and I, I developed that relationship through that koinonia with other Christians. It's beautiful. I remember praying and, and uh, praying through acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, and that as I drew near to God, God drew near to me. It's a beautiful thing. Now question. As Christians, when we start feeling distant from God again, when we drift away from God, and there's seasons sometimes that happens, um, does that mean God has moved? No. In him we live and move and have our being, right? Jesus promised, lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He, he, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So if you feel distant from God, 
What do we need to do? James answers that question. It says this, James 4, 8, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Two things. We need to start practicing those spiritual disciplines and draw near to God again. Start having those devotions again. Start having those times of prayer. Start you know, having that worship music playing in your house or your car and drawing near to God and he will draw near to you. But the second thing is also repent. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. He'll forgive our sins and he'll cleanse us. Or another version says purify us from all unrighteousness. You know, it's interesting. Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians and then several years later, um, Jesus addressed this Ephesian church uh, in Revelation. And he said this, because the church and the Christians in this church had drifted, and they needed to draw near to God again. And he said this to the church in Ephesus. He said, uh, Revelation 2, verse 4, but I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. You see that again? It says, come back. Draw near to God. And then also repent. And then as you draw near to God, God will draw near to you too. Nearness to God, our first uh, wonderful blessing, benefit that we have in Christ. Now, second one, verse 14, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in his ordinances, then in himself he might make two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, and by it having put to death the enmity. Now, here's the second word I'm going to give you. First word was nearness. The second word is reconciliation. And here's what was going on in, the new, in this time period in the um, uh, New Testament church and in uh, the Roman culture at the time. There was, a, there was a division among Jewish and Gentile people. There was a dividing wall actually at the Temple Mount. And, and what the dividing wall was, it was the dividing wall between the court of the Gentiles and the inner court of the Jews. And there was actually a sign that said this. It said, if any Gentile or foreigner comes past this dividing wall, they will face capital punishment. They'll be killed. Now what Paul is saying here is that dividing wall has been taken down when Jesus died at the cross. Galatians chapter three, verse 28, tells us that there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there's neither male nor female, you're all one in Christ Jesus. Now what does that have to do with us? We don't have conflict among Jew and Gentile here at Calvary Chapel. As far as I know, we don't. Actually, we're having a Jews for Jesus person come and do our Good Friday service. So what does that have to do with us? Well, the most segregated hour in the, our culture today here in the United States is the church hour. And we need to, I think we need to be people that are, are saying, no, that's not right. We need to be people that are, 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 are going with what heaven does. And what heaven does is every tribe, every nation, every people is before the throne of God and they're worshiping Jesus Christ. You know, when, when Promise Keepers was really going big time back in the 90s, one of the things, that, the reason why I think God was blessing that movement of reaching these men and, and, and a lot of men were being reached and there was a lot of men coming to Christ and a lot of men were repenting but a part of what their, their priorities was, was racial reconciliation. And they prioritized that. And I think that's one of the reasons why God blessed that movement. I remember I went to a pastor's conference for Promise Keepers that they put on. There was, was the Georgia Dome in Atlanta. And there was 40,000 pastors there. As, 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 I, as I can remember, that's probably the largest gathering of pastors in the history of the church. And I remember some of the greatest Bible teachers in our generation there. Chuck Swindoll was there. Um, uh, Tony Evans was there. Evie Hill was there. Jack Hayford was there. And then about halfway through the, the event that we had, um, they decided to do an altar call for all the pastors of color. The pastors, the African-American pastors, the Asian pastors, 
you know, uh, all the different uh, races that were different than Caucasian, they, they had them come forward, and as they came forward, us ca- ca- Caucasian pastors, we cheered for them, and we honored them, and then we prayed for them, and then we worshiped some more with them, and you know what happened? The ceiling of the Georgia Dome opened. No, it didn't really, but it, <laughs> it seemed like the ceiling opened with the presence of God falling upon us and the smile of God on that whole thing of just honoring these pastors of color. And, that, and, and you know what? God was pleased with that. And one of the things we should be all about as, as believers in Jesus Christ is red, yellow, black, or white, every person is precious in God's sight. Amen? The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And that's what Paul's saying about reconciliation here. Between all races, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're one in Christ. Amen? All right, now let's go to the next one. So we got, we got nearness, we got reconciliation. Here's the next one. Peace. Look at verse 17. And he came and he preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. Jesus, we're told in Isaiah 9, 6, it says this. It says, that for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and what? Prince of Peace. We're, we're told that also in John 14, 27 by Jesus, peace I leave with you, with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Don't let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Peace. Now, there's three kinds of peace that Jesus gives us. First of all, he gives us peace with God. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So the first peace we have is peace with God. The second kind of peace we have is peace with one another. We're told in, in Scripture that we are to be people that are seeking peace with other people. It says in uh, Matthew 5, 9, it says that blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We're told in Romans chapter 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, what? Be at peace with all men. We're also told that if we're presenting our offering, Matthew 5, 23, at the altar, and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Jesus said that it's so important that we seek peace with other people that even if you're worshiping and, and you see that you need to make something right with your brother, make, make it right with your brother first. So peace with God, peace with other people. But here's the third kind of peace Jesus wants to give. It's peace with yourself. It says in Philippians 4, 6, It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And here it is. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace with yourself. Peace within yourself. I remember before I came to Christ, I was trying to find peace. (laughs) And I tried all kinds of avenues before coming to Christ to try to find peace within. And I, I, I remember I read a bunch of self-help books. And those self-help books didn't help myself with peace at all. And then I, I remember I tried a, a positive mental attitude. I read this book, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. And, and, and there's, it's, it's, I think there's some truth in the fact that we need to be people that think positively. We need to be people as a man thinks, so he is. And it helped me in, in regards to thinking more positively, but it, it didn't bring me peace. And I'm almost ashamed to admit it. I, I went from that to, this was the 70s, and <laughs> I, I, I heard about this thing called transcendental, transcendental meditation. And so I, uh, I tried the TM, transcendental med- meditation, and I, 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 I tried to twist my legs like they said to twist my legs, and it was like a pretzel. And I go, this is not good, this hurts. And then, and then I, I did the hum, and, and I did that, and I, I realized this is not bringing me peace. This is, just, this is just weird. And then I came to Christ. 
And I'll never forget, Jesus fulfilled what he promised to me. He said in Matthew 11, the promise, come to me all who are weary, heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Amen? Amen. So it's, 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 it's peace. He brought us peace. And you know, um, if you want more peace, it's found in the Prince of Peace. And, and he gives you peace with, with the Father, with God. He gives you peace, you know, with your relationship with others. And then he gives you peace, peace within. It'll guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Now let's go on. After peace, it says, for through him we have both our access and one spirit to the Father. Now, here's the fourth word I want to give you. Access. And the word there means this. It means when an official brings you admission to a king. And Jesus is our official. And what he did when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished, paid in full. And then after he declared that our sins are paid for on the cross, right before he died, he said this, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then something incredible happened. The veil in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. Now that veil was this thick veil in the temple that separated the holy place in the temple from the holy of holy place. And on one day of the year, the high priest was allowed to go into the holy of holy places, and he would go there, and he'd sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat that was at the Ark of the Covenant for the sins of the people. Now, we know from Scripture that he would go in there, and he would go in there, and he would have bells on his robe, and then he'd have a rope around his ankle, and when he'd go in there, that, that if he wasn't right with God, God, because of the holiness of God's presence, God would strike him dead. Uh, and then they'd, pull, they'd hear the bells ring because he'd fall over, and then they'd pull him back out. Anybody else uh, want that job? <laughs> Boy, Wow. But it was, it was the presence of God. And what happened when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was torn from the top to the bottom to tell us that we now have full access to the presence of God 24-7, you know, 365 days a year. Hmm. And that's why the book of Hebrews says this, Hebrews 10, verse 19, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, and that is his flesh. Then it also says, Hebrews 4, 16, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus has given us access through what he did on the cross to God's presence, and it's a wonderful thing. So the fourth word is access. Let's go on now, and it says this. So then now you are no longer, verse 19, strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints in our God's household. Now the, the fourth word I want to give, or the, the fifth word I want to give you there is family. Because when it says that when we come to Christ, when the Ephesians came to Christ, and when we came to Christ, we become a part of God's household. The word there, household, in the Greek is oikios. And it means, literally, God's home. Implication? When you come to Christ, you become a part of God's home and God's family. And we know that from Romans chapter 8. Because Romans chapter 8 tells us in that beautiful scripture about being part of God's family, for, you all, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Literally translated, Daddy, Papa. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. And if children, we're heirs also, we're heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also may be glorified with him. And then Ephesians 1.5 says something very similar. It says, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. When we come to Christ, 
we become a part of his family. We're adopted. Sons and daughters of God. It's a little bit of a stretch, but when I think about becoming a part of God's home, God's family, God's household, I think of my dog Jojo. My dog Jojo, um, we, we uh, r- rescued her in some way. She ended up in the church parking lot here, and we brought her in, and she became the most affectionate dog I've ever had. If I want to get some love, I just got to go spend some time with Jojo. But um, Jojo, um, I'm a dog lover, and so Jojo is a part of our family. When we take a dog on, that dog becomes a part of our family. Actually, let's show a picture of Jojo. Right there. There she is right there. Yeah. And, and how, do, how do we know that Jojo is a part of my family? Because Jojo's got her own couch. That's, that's, her, that's her couch right there. And, 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 that's, and that's, that's her blanket right there, too. And then, at nighttime, when I go to bed, what happens is this. I'll go in, in, to bed, and our couch is right next to JoJo's couch, and, and what, what, what happens is, sometimes, by the way, when we're watching TV, JoJo jumps on the blanket, and she watches TV. I think she watches TV with us. But anyways... When I go to bed at nighttime, uh, I'll go to bed and I'll hear Jojo jump off the bed and guess where she goes? She jumps on my couch and I know that because I'll, I'll get up in the morning sometimes and she leaves the couch. I can hear as I'm getting up, she, she, she knows she's not supposed to be on her couch so she'll leave the couch but I'll go sit on my couch and you know what? It's warm. <laughs> so what I'm saying here is this. Jojo is a part of our family, it's part of our home, part of our household. She gets these privileges. And it's the same with us. As we get into God's family through Christ, we have privileges. That's why it's said back in Romans chapter 8 that we're joint heirs with Christ. All that Christ has inherited in heaven, we're going to inherit one day too. We're going to be given immortal, imperishable bodies when we get there. We're going to get the, 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 the fact that we're going to see him as he is, and we too will be like him. Our, our sin nature will be taken away. We're going to be in the worship of the Lamb of God and with, the, with, the, with all the angels of heaven for the rest of eternity. It's going to be amazing. We have so much to look forward to. And because we're a part of God's household, we have these privileges that come with being a part of God's family. Amen? And that's what's being talked about right here. It's wonderful. Let's go on our scripture now. It says, after we're a part of God's household, verse 20, it says, having been built upon with the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now here's the picture. The church is the building. Did you know that this physical building is not the church? We are the building. It says in First Peter, it says that we are living stones and we're making up God's house. And what's going to be causing the growth we need as a church and as individuals? Let's go back to it. And that, by the way, that's our last word, growth. First of all, the foundation for our spiritual lives and for this church needs to be the apostles and prophets. What's that mean? It means the ones that wrote the scripture that scripture needs to be our foundation. It says in Acts 2.42, the early church continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We need to be continually devoting ourselves to God's word. If we're going to grow as a church, we're going to keep devoting ourselves to God's word. If we're going to grow as individuals, we've got to be in God's word. Because 1 Peter 2.2 says, like newborn babes, we're to long for the pure milk of, of, of the word so that we may grow in respect to our salvation. Growth comes from committing ourselves to God's word. The second thing we see there for growth is Jesus Christ has to be the cornerstone. Now what's the cornerstone? The cornerstone was the foundation for anything that was being built. And so for this church and for our personal lives, Jesus needs to be our foundation. And then the cornerstone also set the direction. He needs to set the direction for this church and for our lives. Because Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, 
And he'll make your path straight, or he'll direct your paths. And then also, if, if we're going to be this church and these individuals are growing, we need to realize that it's a work of the Spirit. It says, in whom also you're being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18 talks about that as we behold his face. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as a mirror, the, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. That's what we're all about as a church. As we come together, we want to be a people that are beholding God's glory and people of the Spirit. You know, we're walking in the Spirit because as we're being filled with the Spirit, we're singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord, we're speaking to one another psalms and hymns, and we're giving thanks to our God. And as we behold Him in the Spirit, He changes us from glory to glory into His image. Amen? So what are our words today? Let's go back. First word, let's go back. Nearness. And then as the blood of Christ cleanses us from sin, we have the ability to draw near to God and God draws near to us. Second word, reconciliation. And we need to be people that are seeking reconciliation and also people of reconciliation with all different people groups because every tribe and every nation, every people is a part of heaven. Let's bring heaven now to, to, to the church today. Then the third word we had was peace. Peace with God, peace with others, peace with ourselves. Amen? And that, that peace is found in the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Number four, access. And we have access through the blood of Christ, through the veil being torn in the temple. And our access is to God the Father through Jesus Christ. He's the only way. Fifth, fifth word we have is family. When we come into Christ in his grace, when we come into a relationship with Christ, we become a part of his household, his oikios, his, 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 uh, his home. And then the sixth word we have is growth. And the way we grow, by being people of the word, people that have the foundation of Jesus Christ, right? And people that are walking and living in the spirit of God. Amen, church? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for another Sunday we could be in your word, God, as we talked about your word being that which, which helps us grow, God. And I pray that we would continue to be people that are, 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 have that foundation of your word, God, because we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth, Father. And I pray, too, that we would be people that are people of reconciliation. And, Father, I pray that we would be seeking re reconciliation with all people groups out there. Help us never to think that we're better than anybody else, Lord, because we're not. We're just sinners saved by your grace, God. Father, I pray for peace, too. I pray that we be people that realize that the only source for peace is Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. And though through Jesus Christ, we could have peace with you, Father. We could have peace with others. And we could have peace even with ourselves. Because your peace can guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray, too, that we would be people that realize we have the benefit of access to God through Jesus Christ that the veil has been torn from the top to the bottom. And we could draw near to you through the blood of Christ because we have that access to what Jesus did on the cross. Father, I, I thank you too for the benefit of family, that we are one family in Christ. We're one in Christ. We thank you for all the privileges that come from being a part of your family, your household, Lord. And lastly, Lord, I pray that we'd be a growing people and a growing church. Help us to be people that are, again, just people of your spirit, people of your word, people that are allowing you, Jesus, to be our foundation for our lives and for this church. Thank you again, Father, for this Palm Sunday. Thank you, Jesus, for being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you for your word that feeds us, Lord. And, and again, just thank you for this Easter coming up too, Lord. I pray that as we come into this Easter season, we would just be people that are just celebrating Jesus because he not only died for our sins, but he rose and he conquered death. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. All right, let's stand, church. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and give you peace. May the Lord just give you a beautiful week this week as we enter into this holy week. May the Lord just give you a sense of his love and his grace and his peace to you this week. And as we celebrate the, the death of Christ for our sins on Friday. May we remember, it's called Good Friday for a reason. 
because it's the day that Jesus gave us access to God through his death on the cross. And then as we come into Easter Sunday, next Sunday, may we be people of victory, people that walk in the truth. Even all week long, may we remember that Jesus conquered death, right? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. And the victory was won on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. And the Lord bless you this week. It'll be a beautiful week in him. Let's go out with a song. Let's just give the Lord some praise this morning as we go out with this song. May this song just be a, a way for us just to declare again that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Bless the church. Let's sing.